So the question was, when a woman has had a C-section in her previous pregnancy and she wants to deliver at home now, what, how do we support them in their choices and is that a reasonable choice? Is that the question? I think that what, what we understand is that um, there, there is controversy around this issue and I think what we need to look at is what the, um, what the level of risk is. So a woman who, why did she have her first C-section? What kind of surgery did she have? Will that surgery have an impact on her future, on her next pregnancy? How close is she is, is she, uh, is her home to uh, receiving emergency care of, of some kind? The, the question and the reason people are worried is because there is a sense that, uh, that women are at risk for having uh, what's called a uterine rupture or uterine dehiscence where the scar or somewhere near the scar opens up and, and the woman experiences bleeding and the baby does not react well to that. That's a serious complication, but it happens in a very, very tiny proportion of women who had a single low transverse scar who are more than two years away from their previous birth. There's actually quite a lot of data out about whether or not we should be encouraging people just to deliver vaginally the next time. So the question is, if you would, if you would encourage a woman to deliver in a small community hospital where you don't have immediate anesthesia and you don't have immediate surgery capabilities, uh, but you would have the opportunity to monitor the course of labor and the baby's well-being, how different is that from what we can provide at home? There, is a difference, there are differences in opinion about, even among midwives uh, within the midwifery community and across midwives and physicians who are afraid of or not afraid of, of VBAC, but there isn't as much variance in their fear of something like induction or many other things that we do who carry, which carry similar statistical risks. Now, the statistical risk is difficult to translate into a decision for yourself, right? Because if it's you and you have a problem with that, I think that the most, of, the most that we can do is to really be very honest with families about what we know and what we don't know. We don't have a study about VBAC at home. We don't have, we have some data, I think, from, from Patty's study, and she can talk about that, but not large, large information. So we can't really say it's uh, more, sa more safe, less safe. We can talk about the what we might be able to offer in different settings, and, and then families have to decide what makes them. And, and for fundamentally, this is a country that respects women's choices. So supporting them in choices once they've fully understood what we can offer them in different settings and what people are concerned about is a different, it's a different question, right? Um, one thing I really think we have to emphasize to women is that uterine rupture does happen even when you don't have a vaginal birth planned. And so if you're planning a cesarean section, you can still have uterine rupture before you even get well into labor. And there's variation across studies. But in general, the difference in risk for uterine rupture between a woman planning a cesarean birth compared to a vaginal birth is about 2 to 3 per thousand. So that's really the number. It's not 2 to 3 in 100. It's 2 to 3 in 1,000 difference. And people need to know about that. And in our home birth st study that we did, we had about 90 um, VBACs happening at home. That's a very small number, um, but we didn't have problems with those. But there were situations within um, the home birth group where midwives saw some warning signs and brought people into hospital early, early, um, and were able to recognize that. Now, you can't always recognize a problem coming very quickly if you are going to have a uterine rupture. However, people just need to know the reality of the risks and talk about it with their doctor um, so that they really know the facts before they become frightened um, of the possibilities. So when we think about risk, perception of risk is a big part of that. 
So my perception of the risk associated with VBAC is high because I have operated on women with uterine rupture and contrary to opinion that it's at or near the uterine scar, women with VBAC can rupture at any place in their uterus. I had one that ruptured on the posterior wall of her uterus because she declined intervention. The other thing that physicians do look at and obstetricians do look at is that in a, in a situation where you have a completely, absolutely normal baby and then you have a catastrophic event, so the uterus really coming apart in a hurry, you have 17 minutes to intervene before that baby is likely to have sustained some kind of risk. And even though those risks are small, if I, a patient asks me like my recommendation, I would recommend that they have a birth in hospital for a VBAC. I would completely at all times support a woman's choice to have a VBAC, even if she did not have the best set of risk factors, because I believe fundamentally it is the woman's choice. And if she told me she was going to birth at home, I would work, work very hard to find her a midwife that would support her in that choice. But at the same time, if I were to advocate for that, I think my perception of risk is that the risk of needing, and it's not just risk to the baby that women need to be aware of, it's risk to the other parts of their body. So when we do a cesarean section for a ruptured uterus, uh, it we, we, there's risks of injury to the bladder and other things because we're trying to get the baby out in a big hurry. And so when we look at those risks, even though they're small to us as healthcare providers, we might say, well, that's recoverable. In some women, it goes on to be a long-term issue. So that's, I, I'm not, if, a, if, a, if you don't talk to a surgeon, you might not get those nuances of those risks because if I got a phone call from an, a midwife at home saying I'm bringing in a woman that I think is ruptured, I'm, of course, going to be standing in the OR waiting for that person to come. Uh, and, I would, um, and I would be in a hurry to get the baby out. And at that point, you're not as worried about what other things might happen during the surgery. And so there are some things associated with that. But, and it, again, it's perception of risk. I also don't think that if I was having a VBAC that I would have it in a small rural hospital. I would want to be in a hospital where I knew that at least the obstetrician was within 10 minutes and could be there, and that's what I would be asking for. And, and certainly in our facility, if we have, a, as obstetricians, a patient that's having a VBAC, we would often choose to be in the hospital rather than out of the hospital just so that we, we ta eliminate that um, from, the, from the formula, that we eliminate the, um, the need to get the obstetrician there. So it is a controversial subject, and it is a subject where the, the College of Physicians and Surgeons made a big change uh, in their uh, put, uh, view on home birth, but they continued to feel that vaginal birth after cesarean should occur in a hospital setting. Um, I, I, since, since this is um, a conversation discussion, I'll give you a little bit of the other side of what of the perception of this risk thing because there are some women who will choose uh, VBAC at home because their memory of what they went through uh, with their previous C-section and their, their understanding of how they will react to that memory may affect their labor. They believe that it will affect their labor. And if it affects their labor and they're more at risk for a repeat C-section, that's clearly not safer. We know that repeat sections are actually the least safe, um, safe option. So that that's why you know all over North America we are encouraging VBAC for women who have the conditions that I talked about, um, and 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 the absolute risk we we need to voice it. It's 0.5 percent. So what we're talking about is that 99.5 percent of women deliver normally, and and so that 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 I mean. For, as, as, as you say, if, if Brenda sees proportionally more, it's because she, that's her job. Her job is to see the, and to take care of and to respond to urgent situations. And I see proportionally less because that's my job. So, of course, as midwives and as physicians, we're going to have a slightly different approaches to that. What matters is what that risk means to the woman. If she feels that, a, you know, a 99.5% chance that everything is going to be just fine and she can have a, a, a undisturbed birth in her own setting, that may be an acceptable risk to her, even understanding that if she's in the 0.5%, that the option is, it's not like, you know, most home births, the transfers of home births are about 5 to 8%. 
so up to 10 to 12, depending on the country you're in, after you get to term, if you're low risk and you start labor at home, about 5 to 8 percent of those people will uh, transfer to hospital. Maybe slightly higher given the jurisdiction that you're in and the standards for when you transfer. We used to transfer people here, for example, uh, if they needed um, IV therapy, we used to take them in for um, antibiotics and then some people would stay instead of going back home. That changed and so now more people have an opportunity to be at home. So things are constantly changing that way, but I, if you just look at low-risk women, the people who transfer from home to hospital once they go into labor, the large proportion of that is 80% of them are first-time moms who have a prolonged labor who after 30 hours of labor, the kind thing to do is to take, go in and get a little augmentation, a little help. It is not an urgent rush, rush thing. Urgent transfers are one per thousand. Those are pretty good odds, right? So we're talking about, you know, so the, there is an increased risk when you plan a VBAC at home in that you are, you're not in that category that has th all those really low things. So if you had to be, transfer, there's a, you've added one extra factor. So some, some midwives won't attend people who smoke at home. Some midwives won't attend anybody who doesn't plan to breastfeed at home because that also increases your risk and your risk not just for the birth but for the immediate postpartum period. But th th those are things that we should be talking about together. And the women, uh, the women should be, and the family should, with, with honest information about what we know and what we don't know. We don't have any data that, that VBAC is safe, nor do we have, v uh, have data that VBAC is unsafe. And that's the truth, and it's not okay to say because we don't have data, it's not safe. What we can say honestly is, in, in my experience, I wouldn't do this or I'm concerned about this, and I can say in my experience, I've seen women who, who planned hospital births with VBAC, and the moment they were doing great at home, and the moment they walked in that door, everything shut down, and it was almost like a PTSD, uh, you know, reaction. Whereas women who deliver at home after VBAC feel even more empowered and like some part of their life and their psyche has been given back to them. And that's, that's health. That's long-term health. So those things are, are things that I, I'm not advocating for one or the other, but I do feel that the perception of risk, as Brenda, is, is, is an important thing to address head-on and, and that the, um, the most important person is the woman who's making that decision about her perception of risk. And I probably didn't articulate that uh, as well as I would have liked, which is that's my perception of risk and it is gonna be different than maybe the patients. We always have difference. You know, I have women that I'm sure have uterine cancer. I had one recently and she didn't want surgery because she did not perceive that as a big risk. But when she started to perceive that as a risk, then she wanted her surgery. So. You, don't, uh, you never force patients to do things, and you always have to realize that different people have different paradigms. And I do think that whole issue that Sarah's brought up about the previous traumatic birth in a hospital, uh, that is really sad. And, and I do think that as healthcare providers in hospital settings, we need to ask ourselves why. Like, what did we do that contributed to that, and could we have done differently? And that's certainly where I begin a conversation with a woman who has trepidation about doing VBAC. Remember that I spend a lot of time trying to talk women into having a VBAC at all. So I would never have to talk them into having a VBAC at home. Um, whereas Sarah is coming from a totally different patient population. Patients are coming often motivated for that vaginal birth. That's why they're going to a midwife. So she doesn't even have to convince them that VBAC is safe, whereas that's where I start from. <laughs> 